Okay, so so I wanted to we we were talking about uh, people's reaction to you when you first came out with your uh, critiques of artificial intelligence. What were people? You said people were criticizing well, you for your the right. way you looked and down there everything. That's right. Well, the the Rand people didn't want to publish it, and. Uh, they started this critique, but mostly at MIT. They were saying, that we don't have to care about what Dreyfus says, he's just a philosopher, and moreover, he doesn't even know how to program, all of which was quite true. And their word, their name for me was the weasel, apparently. And they, uh, but I learned sort of that they ordered a case of my book, What Computers Can't Do, and gave it to everybody in the artificial intelligence laboratory and said, now think up arguments against this. And uh, that's, there was, so that was going on. And then I and, was... And what did, you, what did you look like back then? Oh, well, I looked then. It, that was the, I don't know whether that, it was, when it was, the early 70s. I guess I had, well, I always had bright red hair, just very, very bright red hair. And then, during the middle 70s, I had long curls and beads, and I remember a white Mexican kind of shirt, and uh, I was just a hippie, and, and, and a leather jacket with fringes and so forth. But that was a little later. That I think that the, when the AI thing began, I was still a clean-cut Harvard person, and the, the uh, uh, what do you call them, the hippies hadn't really hit San Francisco yet. Uh, what, what, you just think you have a hippie spirit, or what, what, what gravitated you towards a hippie aesthetic? Oh, I just felt very happy with it, and uh, I, never, I never wanted to wear a coat and tie. I, I, that's one reason I never wanted to teach at Harvard, when, where in those days, even the, grad, even the stu undergraduates had to wear a jacket and tie to, to meals. All that sounded terrible. I had a friend, a roommate at one point, who went to the meal with a jacket and tie but no pants and caused a, a semi-riot. Uh, but weren't you, weren't, weren't you like uh, growing uh, marijuana in your office or something? In, back, in the backyard at home where I had a big backyard, yes, I was growing lovely marijuana plants. That must have been in the middle of the 70s also. I mean, the world was wonderful in those days to me because I went back and forth between MIT, which was one of the straightest places left, and Berkeley, obviously the wildest place on earth at that point, And because I, I was teaching in both places at alternate semesters for further crazy reasons. I forgot all about this. The, the whole philosophy department hated me for other reasons than the artificial intelligence people. They hated me just because I was teaching Heidegger and uh, mostly because of Heidegger, but generally they didn't think continental philosophy, as it was called, was any good at all. And the main power in the philosophy department, a woman named uh, Judith, Judith Thompson, called it Stone Age philosophy and wouldn't one, wouldn't let the library spend any money on the books that I was trying to read and assign, and wouldn't let me teach graduate students. And so, I, and so they all, they considered me an enemy. And then this funny thing happened. They, the guy, a famous philosopher of religion, Houston Smith, was there, and he got offered a job someplace else. And he said that he wanted to, uh, have me teach courses in the graduate program. And they said, no. And so the president of MIT said, well, what would keep you here? And he said, I need somebody to talk to about continental philosophy, so I need to be able to invite whoever I please as a visitor to teach here once every, a, a, a semester each year. And they said, okay. So he said, okay, then I invite uh, Bert Dreyfus back from MIT, I'd just gone there, to talk to me and teach here next uh, year. And the, the philosophy department said, no, we're never going to let him teach in the philosophy department. And Houston Smith said that I have the right to invite him. And so I ended up invited and paid a full salary to teach nothing, uh, just to talk to Houston Smith when he felt like it. And that, that was just craziness. And how do you feel now that you've kind of been vindicated? Well, it feels nice. Every once in a while I think about it. I mean, the MIT philosophy department would still not hire me, I think, because they're straight analytic. But the computer people, it happened, it, there was a moment when it happened. First, there was the time which I was telling you about where Latvizada, a famous professor here at Berkeley, was organizing 
yearly meetings, confrontations between me and the AI people teaching here, but also teaching in uh, Stanford and so forth, and with an audience of about 500 people. And uh, they would tell me what their greatest successes were, and I would point out how these were sort of not generalizable and didn't really show what they claimed. And once I was, a, I was really brave. They said, we've got a car that will drive on the street in, in traffic from here to there with, with, with that, because it has, and with no human driver. And I said, I doubt it. And they said, we're telling you we've got it. And, I'm te and I said, I'm telling you that you haven't got it. You're lying. And, they, we, and I was right. I mean, it was just that reality was on my side. I won every one of those debates, which went on every year for about five years. One, in the sense that... And you said that you had, you had a, a, a whole debate against... Um, uh, where, where they invited everyone to just be against you? Well, there, yes, in effect. Zada, Zada had a middle position. He thought that the AI just people... Sit were, up a little more. He thought the AI people were wrong. But he thought that uh, he had the solution to it, and I thought his solution was wrong. So there was a kind of roughly three-way debate, but mostly Zada just chaired the thing, and I fought with the AI people, and we insulted each other. And, uh, but I was going to tell you the funny up outcome of that, but I can't remember what it was. Wait, I want to talk, talk, we spent a lot of time. I want to talk, uh, uh, I think it's this whole counterculture and swimming against the current might be a good lead way into uh, talking a little bit about authenticity and, and what it means to kind of have a, a respect for the culture, but at the same time uh, not do what one does necessarily and fight against the grain, because I think that kind of fits your, uh, the way you've approached That's your right. philosophy and teaching. Can that, you just introduce that concept a little bit? Yeah. But, uh, it, like means, it means, it means, well, no, I mean, uh, the, what, the, the phenomenology of it is sort of interesting because now people say, didn't you feel, weren't you courageous to do it? And didn't you feel that you were sort of on this, in this dangerous kind of mission? And it's true, they tried to keep, the AI people tried to keep me from getting tenure at MIT. And that, that is dangerous. Uh, but anyway, one thing is, it's great to have something like a calling, and I felt that I knew what was right, and I felt that it was wrong that they were saying these things which were false, and that they weren't paying attention to the, the, the obvious arguments against what they were doing. But I didn't feel courageous, and I didn't feel as if I had a calling. This is what I think is interesting. I mean, it just, it just the way it presented itself to me is these people are saying and doing outrageous things, and conning the media and through the media the rest of the world and uh, that's just wrong and so I will tell people it's wrong. It, I didn't think, gee, that's risky, shall I do it or not? Or wow, it take right. courageous. Can you talk, can you generalize about authenticity and what it means to be an authentic uh, Not being? much, because I think it's so... And talk about the one? There's, well, okay, there is, uh, I've I've always been so outside it that, it that I guess that's one reason I find Heidegger attractive. There is what Heidegger calls the one, which is his name for what it, the, the social norms. That is, you do what one does. You uh, drive on the right-hand side of the street, you uh, uh, whatever. I mean, there's so many things that one does, everything that one does. You wear clothes, you... Uh, you uh, what you don't you don't uh, get in people's faces when you talk to them you stand the distance that one is supposed to stand in your culture when you talk to people and so forth and i've always and one of the features of an authentic person is that they do what seems to them to be well first there is there there are two ways of being outside of the one there, if you think of the one as the most banal general common way to do things then even the phronimus, the, high, the Aristotelian person of practical wisdom is outside the one because they respond to the unique situation, whereas the one follows some general rule about what to do. The, the, the uh, social personal master uh, does the appropriate thing at the appropriate, in the appropriate way at the appropriate time, Aristotle says, and that looks uh, weird 
to the people who are just trying to do what everybody approves of and what the, the neighbors would would like you to do and so forth. Now I've I don't know if I've ever been so much like a phronimus, that, that is a social master. I think of myself not like that. No, but it's not that I talk about it. But wait, wait, it's let me. To you. I, want to hear about I know, but I, I but I can only do it in terms of my own phenomena. The other of kind of authenticity, which is the relevant kind here, is not to do what one does, not even to do a kind of sharpened up better version of what one does, which was what the uh, person of practical wisdom does, that's halfway to authenticity, according to Heidegger. But to go all the way to authenticity is to have your own unique way of doing things, to have your calling, your take on things, and not doing what the really refined, wise people think is the appropriate thing at the appropriate time in the appropriate way, but something that is outrageous from everybody else's point of view. But it seems that the only way to do that is to first pass through the other levels of having uh, 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 knowing how one does it. Yes. You can't just come out of left field. That's right. If you, or you're just crazy. Yeah. If, you, if you sort of throw off all your clothes and roll in the flowers at lunchtime when everybody else is, is eating their sauerkraut and wurst or something, that's, that isn't it. No. I once thought it was. I once thought, I really had to learn Heidegger over many years. I once thought authenticity was just doing things that seemed to you okay and to other people crazy. But that's not it at all. First, you have to see through the banality of the general norms. Don't just do what one does because one does it. And, you look, and don't do things that just make you look good and get approval. And then, that's halfway there in, in Heidegger's way of thinking about it. But then the next thing is to be able to actually invent some new way of acting. Then you become more than just a, a, a master of the current culture. You become somebody able who could, at their best, transform the current culture. And yet, anybody who can do that probably could easily do it the way the culture does it. I mean, take someone who redefined, uh, 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 does a new move in basketball uh, that, that or plays in a way that yeah, no apparently played before. Yeah. I, they had to first play better than everybody else on their terms. That's probably, that's right? right. For one thing, that's to, to to get people to pay attention and, and and appreciate it and not think it's just crazy. And yeah, apparently Michael Jordan does that or did that in basketball and making it away for, taking it away from being a team thing and trying just to make as many baskets as he could. And at first people thought that was crazy and then they thought it was annoying and then they saw that was the right thing to do. I mean, it works better and now apparently everybody does it that way. Uh, there's the famous example that these the Norwegian sports people that I go and talk to a lot is the Fosbury flop, the guy who discovered that, that you could pole vault or high jump, I forget which, go over a barrier backwards. So he, he went, he jumps with his back to the thing he's jumping over. And that was, of course, totally everybody else went sort of dived over and everybody thought it was crazy but he won gold medals at the Olympics and now everybody does the it's the high jump everybody does the high jump that his way so so people are able to reinvent and, and make progress and move forward by uh, 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 first acknowledging and, and embracing the way one does it and then somehow moving beyond that and, and then doing that very very well the, what but but not radically breaking with how one does it. That's, the Arist that's how far Aristotle got with the, do the being an, a, a master of the current culture, right? And then, going even beyond that, doing with, with that so that people will pay attention to you and respect you, if you can stand on that and then do something brand new, which, if it's really good, will become part of the, what one does eventually, then you've got the highest form. And that's authenticity, that is, uh, being able to, in the sort of Heidegger jargon, disclose new worlds, or to put it in another way, the phronimus sort of plays the, by the rules of the game and does it best. But then somebody could change the rules of the game, in effect, the, how it's done, that's even more impressive. And the, the person that, that, that does this, they probably all share in common uh, receptivity to what that particular moment in the culture needs. Ah, and, uh, interesting. And what that, uh, 
and what's called for at that moment compared to all other times before that. That's good. Yes, of course, they've, they've got this kind of calling. They've got the, uh, a, a calling to get their identity by, I, mean, I guess I was doing it with, against the AI people. There, there was no such academic job attacking all the people in, in, in your department and in the department whose specialty you were attacking and attacking it, so to speak, from, from their point of view, nowhere. That was weird. Can you repeat what I said about the importance of receptivity in that case, maybe? Yeah, I was just going to do that. And what, and what is it like? Well, it's this business of feeling drawn to do it. I mean, it's, it's just not, I mean, it's it, it sounds somehow like something you could describe, but from the outside when you talk about it. But what is this receptivity? It's letting yourself respond to what you experience as having to be done. Uh, that's all you can say about it. And, uh, but it's very important because if you haven't got this openness to what calls you as needing to be done, you're stuck doing the normal routine uh, conformist thing. Do you think that the, this sense of receptivity moves from a receptivity to the particular situation, which is on the basic level of skill, yeah. to a receptivity of what the what is appropriate for that time in the culture in general? Yes, and then further to, to changing the rules of the game, to changing what's appropriate. That's the most amazing kind of receptivity, because you that's when you feel called to do something which you take risks for without even noticing and which other people will bound to consider crazy and which if if it were and, and it's a risk because maybe it is crazy or even if it isn't maybe nobody will believe it isn't and if but if it works then you're in a you help the culture and you are in you feel good and is the culture's job to continuously evolve into new understandings of through these masters do you think Yes, I, again, we come back to this every once in a while. From Heidegger's point of view, the most gratifying, meaningful, memorable thing somebody can do is disclose a new world. That could be huge, like Jesus, and it could be local, like having a dinner in which there's everybody in the same mood and they all come out at their best. But it, it's always being receptive and creating a, situ a unified situation in which things are brought out at their best. I guess that's the highest thing Heidegger thinks you, the things you can do. I agree. Uh, and, and what does it mean uh, to disclose a world? Well, I think I just said. I mean, it, it, it means to, well, what is a world? It's, it's got uh, equipment in it for doing something like the world of business or the theater world or uh, the whatever and it's got people in it with roles for doing things like uh, you know chairman of the board or, or whatever in the business world and director in the theater world and you what you have to do and the world is self-contained it, it, it sets up its own standards for what counts as worth doing and now, and to disclose a world is to, sell, is to set up some kind of activity, some kind of practice, which is self-contained, which has its own sense of what's valuable. We have to put that in. It has its own, uh, the goods of the practice in the, in the jargon of Aristotle. So set up some, in one, set up something self-contained that sets up its own standards of goodness, has in it the role, roles for the people, and brings all that out at its best in a way that in Heidegger large jargon shines and then that's what it is to disclose the world. And, um, hold on, there's one more thing. And it's receptive, uh, maybe you're looking for that, no? Okay. No, 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 that was great, it's okay. great, but there's one more thing I wanted to talk about. Yes, uh, this, uh, we haven't explicitly said the reason we need to do it this way is that uh, human beings don't have a grounded uh, meaning for all people and at all times. Very good. So we need to do it by doing this. Can you say Yeah, that that's very important, saying? right. I will, that's very important. Of course, all this that I've just been saying only makes sense if you're a, some, something like an existential philosopher who believes that there's no human nature and no right way the world should be and no settled thing that is the highest 
good for everybody. Um, the first existentialist was Pascal, who in the 15, was 15? No, 16, at the end of the 1600s, said, custom is our nature meaning that there is no human nature. It is the cultural background practices that define who we are, whether we're going to be heroes or saints or uh, self uh, autonomous subjects or resources. In the history of the West, there's been a whole lot of different understandings. And, so, and since we have no nature, then it becomes very uh, important and rewarding and meaningful for us to define a nature for our culture and our time, that's the highest level, or maybe define a new kind of bi world like the business world and the theater world, but there'll be another kind of world, I don't know, there's the academic world, but we have to think, I mean, some recent new world, I can't think of one right off, but there, there I'm sure there are. I think that's the next highest level, but it's still the same kind of meaning and gratification going on, even if it's just that you're doing a celebratory meal for your family and your friends and you're bringing out the food at its best and they're, they're, them at their best. And, and for a while, this is the self-containedness. It's a world because nothing else going on, not the political situation, not the economic situation, all that becomes irrelevant. And only the relations of these people to each other count and that is a short and that world only happens in Heidegger and Targan now and then here and there for a short time you can create disclose a world now tell me quickly uh, 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 these are types of ideas that we've been talking about uh, some people uh, might think that they're just very abstract and impractical and can you talk a little bit about this dialogue you had with this famous poet about um, uh, the difference between thinking about uh, a philosopher thinking about how to change the world on a practical level and what you do? Okay, yes. One of my oldest friends is a poet named Adrian Rich, who's famous for her total social involvement to help the poor and the people who are oppressed, particularly the women who are oppressed, but in general, everybody and we just recently had this kind of debate where she was writing a poem about me in which she said that uh, I was a Wittgensteinian which is true it could have been Heidegger or Wittgenstein that uh, I but, but let's she uh, namely that I was trying to interpret the world and the poem in the, her draft anyway ends with he was uh, he was studying Wittgenstein, but I was thinking of the philosopher who said, our job is not to interpret the world, but to change it, Marx. And so then I wrote her email after I saw this draft and said, well, that's interesting. And people said to Heidegger, who was trying to understand what it is to be a human being dwelling in the world, and that we had to learn how to dwell in the world, which is all the stuff about world I've just been saying. And people said, yes, but this was right after the war. There's a housing crisis in Germany. They bombed the, all the buildings and firebombed Dresden, and people don't have any place to live. And here you are telling us these fancy talk about, the, about dwelling. And uh, but the question is sort of, and, and the answer might be something like I tried to say to Adrienne, that, well, everybody has their job, and it's certainly a good idea to worry about the people who don't have houses and build them. But if you don't know what it is to be a human being and live in them in a way that is fulfilling and memorable and uh, uh, exciting and uh, taking the risks that go with that and, re and open to the receptivity that you have to have in order to have that, then the housing crisis is just going to be, I mean, fixing the housing crisis isn't going to fix how people are able to live. Okay. And you see your job as, uh, in a way, helping to discover the best way to actually live. That's right. And to discover the way that... Right. Oh, well, yeah. My, well, and I think the right thing to do is to discover the way people live at the, could live at their best. Human beings anywhere need to, in their, each culture does it in its own way. There's no universal rules and there's no universal answer, but you have to find a way to, to, to disclose worlds and to dwell. Now, there's, that's half of what I wanted to say. Oh, yeah, and you have to diagnose what's going on in the current culture that keeps people from doing that. 
that they can get their uh, 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 frozen TV meals and eat, everybody eat in front of their own TV or listening to their own Walkman, and did that sort of subverts the, 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 the family dinner or the celebratory meal. There are, and Heidegger thinks it's important, and I think it's important to show the dangerous, risky practices that even if we solve the housing problem, would leave, a, leave us with meaningless lives, nothing memorable, nothing worth living for. Great. Okay. <laughs> that is wonderful. Just right, too. 6.30. You're such a good prompter. Thank goodness he took all my courses. Cut so for I, a second. He,